Matthew lesson eight. Welcome everybody. Uh, I understand there was a um, some kind of a car crash that happened up in Canada, and I, I think some folks got killed yesterday, last night. You know, we're trying to get the details here and there. Um, you know, these type of things are starting to happen. Uh, we've made commentaries on this page. Uh, I just want everybody to be aware that um, it's very difficult to tell exactly what's going on, whether this is somebody who really just snapped or somebody that's being used or uh, doing something uh, for a hidden agenda or covert action. These kind of things are very difficult to, to, to tell, but um, we're going to keep everybody in prayer in Toronto right now, and we're going to keep our president in prayer and uh, keep the... Um, upcoming meeting next month and with North Korea and prayer all the things that I've been mentioning on this page a lot of people know about so let's take a moment of silent prayer before we get into Matthew lesson 8 which is basically an introduction to Matthew chapter 2 we're going to be getting into and I, I noted this one and, and titled this one as the haughtiness of Herod we'll take a look at King Herod um, a little bit as we open up this chapter 2 of Matthew but let's take a moment of silent prayer keep those folks in Canada in prayer uh, keep our president in prayer and the upcoming meeting and our military all the time, our law enforcement agents. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had that uh, we're about to partake in your word. We're asking for you to touch those lives up there in Canada, Father. We're going to take a moment of silent prayer, not only to wash ourselves clean of any known sins, but also, Father, to ask for your blessings to fall upon families connected to those that are either injured currently up there in Canada or have passed away. Uh, Father, we ask that you touch the families, touch those that are healing in the hospital, Father, and let your light shine, Father, on your precious Son. And it is his name that we pray, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's take that moment of silent prayer. Father, bless this message we're about to receive. We ask these things through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, we're looking at Matthew chapter 8. We're going to get into uh, the introduction of, uh, it's, um, not Matthew chapter 8, I'm sorry, lesson 8. Um, introduction to Matthew chapter 2, the haughtiness of Herod. I kind of like that title, so we're going to we're going to run with that. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to get into Matthew chapter 2 and start right off. We're going to read about the first three scriptures, and I want to take them apart a little bit and take a look at a couple of different things. So let's get into it a little bit. Matthew 2, 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Matthew 2, 2, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. In verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Before we go further, let us take a quick look at Herod the Great, who was first the governor over Galilee and then became the king over Judea. Um, he's an interesting character, and uh, you know history tells us that he was a pretty violent guy, but what they don't tell you is he was actually a pretty sharp guy, but he was bloodthirsty like a lot of leaders back in that day. So we'll take a look at him as an introduction to Matthew chapter 2. Herod the Great was in power from 37, 37 BC to about 4 AD. They called him Herod the Great. First as a governor actually of Galilee, then king over the Jews in Judea. And though there were several Herods due to Herod, Herod the Great's 11 marriages and many, many sons, uh, this is the one referred to at this point in Matthew chapter 2. A lot of his sons went on to become, uh, what do they say, tetriarchs, governors and mayors in the areas all around, and obviously later on took over from the, uh, the throne from him. He was ruthless, yes, no doubt, he was a ruthless leader, but he was lo very loyal, also loyal to who? The Roman Empire. So Herod the Great actually murdered his first wife, if you really look into the history, and it's crazy, some of the things you find out about him. He actually killed a few of his sons, too, but very early on, I think he murdered his first wife, and he had a reputation for being very fierce, a no-nonsense type of leader. He was intelligent. He was a great builder, a great architect, you could say. He had great uh, vision. Uh, he erected towers on 10 of the highest points around Judea, and he implemented one of the first military-style signal systems, so they could look from tower to tower and signal each other, and, um, he doesn't get a lot of credit for certain things he did, but he, he was responsible for a lot of great structures in the Middle East, uh, like theaters and fortresses, a lot of beautiful monuments. Uh, Herod the Great uh, had great vision as far as that goes, and a great eye for architecture. King Herod, Herod the Great, was of an Arab descent, 
Now, he was an Edomite, his bloodline, we would say. He was in the bloodline of Esau, and he converted to Judaism. He was given that Roman citizenship that was so valuable, so important during this period of time because of his deep loyalties to the Roman Empire. Also, the fact that Herod's father was deeply connected to the Roman leadership, and Herod himself was friendly with Mark Antony, which helped him in his political climb to the top. So Herod, as one of these guys that had the connections, you know, how the mafia son's bosses always have connections, they climb to the top. So Herod the Great, this guy was originally, uh, he, had some, he had some serious connections. Obviously, the majority of the religious zealots that were of Jewish descent, meaning like Pharisees and Sadducees and whatnot, did not approve of him, especially even the lower level uh, Jewish folks. They really didn't like them. Um, the, having Herod over them really, really bothered them. And often they, they would uh, have uprisings and protests, but King Herod would squash the unruly crowds with military might that the Roman Empire gave to him. They gave, he had his own squad of Roman soldiers to deal with. And it's interesting because there was the really upper, upper echelon Jewish uh, leaders that actually got cozy. They got comfortable with Herod. And it became the lower level, level leave, leave, uh, leaders, excuse me, and the Jews that were out on the streets, the common Jewish folks, that really started having a problem with Herod over the years. You see, the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees were able to get cozy with King Herod because he wanted the religious approval, but he also wanted to be a good leader for Caesar and follow Roman rule to the letter. And he followed it to the letter. So what you get a glimpse of very early on in this study is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy of both parties involved. And by that, I mean King Herod and the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. King Herod enjoyed the power and wealth of his Roman position. At the same time, he wanted to have a religious connection to the people that he ruled over. And keep in mind, the majority of them hated him. But King Herod kept his foot on the throat of the Jews, that's why. And they were under him, and only really the upper echelon Jewish leaders that I'm mentioning, the religious leaders that were on the higher end, had access to his throne, and they gave each other... Um, Kind of, uh, they gave each other uh, boosts in the community, if you know what I mean. Those Pharisees and Sadducees were able to kind of intermediate between the people and Herod, and Herod was able to use the Pharisees and Sadducees to tell the uh, Roman Empire, say, look, you know, I have them on my side. So they were using each other. They were using each other, but the Jewish leaders and religious leaders had access to his throne, those, those that I'm speaking about, and they, they were given a certain amount of power and respect within the community. The religious leaders of Palestine, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, took full advantage of their position, this, this influence they had with Herod. To them, Herod was a tool to use, and basically a scapegoat to point at when the Jewish people cried out for uh, justice in the streets. They could go out, so they were playing both sides of the coin. This is the thing about hypocrisy. They were playing both sides of the coin. They'd go out in the street and say, oh, that Herod, what a rotten guy he is. And we'll talk to him, we'll straighten this out, and then go to Herod and say, oh, these people, you know, these people are scumbags, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. And they were playing games. And Herod was the same way. So what you're looking at is hypocrisy, right? Hypocrisy finds comfort within its own. It, it looks for, you know how it is, says misery loves company? Well, hypocrisy loves company. Hypocrisy loves hypocrisy. And oftentimes, two parties, talking about hypocrisy, that seem to despise one another, on the surface, find themselves working together and using one another for personal gains. Very, very common, especially in politics. This goes back to the ancient times. At this point, when Jesus Christ was born, King Herod was probably in his late 60s or early 70s, and he had actually become a slightly mentally ill, and he had a lot of physical problems. Um, uh, some brought on by different diseases and stuff that were chewing up his body. And, but the mental illness was making him a little bit more difficult and aggressive to, and uh, difficult to please and more aggressive uh, when it came to dealing with the people. So we now had a king who already had what we would say brutal tendencies towards violence in his younger years. Now he's older and he's got some mental and physical issues because by this point he had also murdered a few of his sons like I mentioned. He had took care of his wife and then he murdered, murdered a few of his sons that he was jealous over who had grown up um, and, and gave, maybe gained a little power. And he was suffering with bouts of anger and delusional behavior. See, not, you're dealing with a guy that had a history already towards violence and being a kind of a cutthroat leader. And now he's starting to have mental and physical issues and he's really getting pushed towards the deep end. So this actually helps set the stage for Matthew chapter 2. So let's take a look at Matthew 2, 1 again. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying... 
Now, when you look at the word magi, we're going to get into the Greek a little bit here. It's uh, magos. It's actually pronounced in the Greek. It means wise men, and they were from areas of Persia and Babylon originally. That's where they originated from. Some of them were considered priests, but they were really oriental mystics. Um, and, and even some of them were considered like um, um, doctors or physicians, mathematicians. But they specialized in things like astrology, witchcraft, sorcery, some medical things. And that's what they depended upon a lot of times. This, is, this was an elite group of traveling magic, magicians, I would say, ancient scientists and doctors. Okay, and, and what you're looking at is, at this point in time, when they came uh, and they were dealing with, when, when they came to Herod looking, they came as a large group. There would never been a, a group of these uh, folks that had come together like this in history. These were men, they were Gentiles, who were sworn into what I would say a fraternity of mystical healing astrology, dream interpretation. And at this point in history, with the event of the virgin birth, there was probably a large group, 50, 50 or more easily, um, of these men in the area. And there are some, uh, you know, I looked at this a little bit, and there are some uh, theologians that believe the majority of the Magi um, had come to this area, which is very, you know, uh, intimidating when you have the, almost the whole group of them that are known throughout the land to come there. They were respected because there was an element of fear when you're dealing with these type of men. Because they were, like I said, you know, some of them were considered magi magicians. They could cast a spell, witchcraft. There was things that they were doing that were a little, bit, a little bit scary. Most common people steered clear of the Magi because they didn't want to mess with any form of witchcraft. And most of the time, the Magi only came into an area and dealt with the leaders, the kings or the leaders or the po local politicians. Because they would dream interpret or be there for medical purposes or whatever. But in this case, there was 50 or more. And like I said, some of the theologians believe there's probably 100 of them, which would have been like all of them. King Herod had become familiar with the Jewish scriptures that pointed out the coming Messiah according to the line of David. He became very concerned about his position. And what was his position? The throne. King of the Jews, right? The throne. What the Romans have given him. Keep in mind, these Magi's were Gentiles, as I mentioned before, and it's a very interesting principle. Matthew 2, 2, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? That's the Magi saying this, right? These guys are very knowledgeable men. This had to set a panic into Herod and those who supported Herod. For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Gentile, scientists, astrologers, magicians knew very little about Jewish scripture, yet they had calculated that a Messiah was born in that area. Something special was going on, and it was becoming obvious to most people in that region. Unbelievers who only relied on science, stars, mathematics, numbers, you know, adding this up and figuring that out, showed up in the largest movement of the Magi probably in hundreds of years in that area. So that gets overlooked a lot of times, but it's a fact. Because a lot of people always think, oh, three wise men or whatever. They have no idea how many showed up. It's very, very interesting when you study the principle. Matthew 2, 3 through 4, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Insecure now, right? He's already half nuts. And all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was born. Notice, Herod is now more interested in biblical prophecy and scripture than at any point in his life prior to this, right? Now all of a sudden he wants to be a real serious student of the word of God. Why? Not for the right reasons. Which, that's what happens with a lot of people. They come running to, to the Word of God. They'll come running to church when they're in trouble. When they should be building up their soul structure, what we call an edification complex, over a long period of time, taking in Bible doctrine regularly, studying the Bible. Not run to it when you're in a panic or something scares you, or you need an answer real quick. And that's what happens with a lot of people. I know once the church I'm affiliated with, after 9-11, the seats were full. The place, if we had faces in there we never saw before, the, the place was full. Within three to five weeks after 9-11, it slowly started to dwindle away. We were back to the normal folks we have there at Bible study. So you can tell when people get emotional with certain things. It's exactly what was going on with Herod right now. King Herod and many of those affiliated with him became worried, panicked, because what they thought was a man-made religion, right, what they thought was a man-made, and they were giving lip service to it, basically, was now unfolding to become a reality right in front of them. It was now unfolding to be like, wait a minute, this is real. This God of Israel, this Messiah coming is hap actually happening. There's a panic going on. See, unbelievers and lukewarm believers, 
those that really don't follow God, but they got born again and saved, will all face a day when the reality of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will stare them right in the face, and it will be too late to do anything. Too late to do anything, but feel regret. Stand there looking like complete fools. It's going to happen. It's, you know, that's, that's my warning to you as a pastor teacher, but it's, and it's not to put guilt or shame on you. It's just a fact. They're going to be unbelievers and lukewarm believers. They're going to be standing there with their jaws open when they're face to face with the Lord saying, oh my gosh, all this stuff is real. Listen, I've been doing political commentaries on this page and I've been um, uh, 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 kind of trying to hint around to things that I found out to be uh, real and true that are behind the scenes that are starting to come out a little bit at a time. And all of it points to uh, the, the coming rapture, the coming end times, all of it. It's all very doctrinal. But if you don't know your scriptures, if you never sat under a prepared pastor teacher, you wouldn't know what the heck is going on. But anyhow, they, these folks are going to end up looking like fools, right? This was the birth of not only the king of the Jews, the real king of the Jews, but the eternal and sovereign God of all kings. You know, king of all kings, God over all gods. Yet, Herod was such a hypocrite as well as hard-hearted that his only concern was what? For his puny little throne. That's all he cared about. He didn't care about the Messiah being on earth, right? He didn't care about that. King Herod was filled with pride. See how arrogance leads to so many sins? It really, really does. It blinds people. He's blind to the fact that the Messiah is always concerned about what he's not going to have if he's going to lose his power and his throne and his wealth. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes what? Before destruction and a haughty spirit, that arrogant spirit, before stumbling. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit, what? Obtains honor. God looks at your heart. Always keep that in mind. The Messiah was born and Herod should have fallen, fallen to his knees with praise and been involved with bringing gifts to the new Messiah. Instead, he stood his ground in what? Arrogance, that haughtiness in his soul. You see, a hypocrite is really just another title for a fake or a phony person. A fake or a phony. A person that through their words and actions portray integrity, but when their agenda is exposed, and it does always get exposed, their vicious and selfish nature bubbles to the surface. It always bubbles up. What's inside always comes out eventually. That's what we want with the fruit of the Spirit, for it to come out of us when we're walking um, in, in, in the power of the Spirit, walking in a new man and we're applying Bible doctrine. What comes out of you is the good stuff, the fruit of the Spirit. You're walking in the flesh. What do you think is going to come out of you? The garbage. King Herod, along with the Pharisees and Sadducees, were knee-deep in hypocrisy, lies, and legalism. Hypocrisy, lies, and legalism. Matthew 2, 5, they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, but this is what has been written by the prophet. This goes back to Micah uh, chapter 5, if you look at a lot of this. In verse 6, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least... Among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. There was more than one area called Bethlehem in ancient history. So it, this had to be correct. It had to be spot on. Notice it names the land of Judah. Right? There it is right there. The Bethlehem named hundreds of years, hundreds of years prior to the birth of Christ was accurate. Also notice it was called the least because Bethlehem of Judah, Judea, that where they're at right there, was closer to a slum than it was a thriving city. Okay, Bethlehem didn't have the best reputation as the wealthiest city. All right, which again, what do we see? We see God use the most unlikely plan that most people would not suspect for the birth of the Messiah. Most unlikely people, unlikely plan. I've been teaching you that since we started this series. Who Jesus Christ appeared to be and where he came from did not fit the mold of what the Jewish leadership wanted. He didn't fit the mold. This was also now a huge threat, think about this, to the Roman-owned and operated throne of King Herod. Herod's in a panic now. Last thing he needs to do is let, the, the, let uh, his Roman superiors find out that there is a real Messiah. That's, this is not just some little fairy, fairy book tale, right? A, a myth or something. But notice, also the shepherd reference is used find it interesting. It's used by the Lord Jesus Christ as a title for himself. He calls himself the Good Shepherd. He's known as the Good Shepherd. So this, this, this prophecy is hundreds, written hundreds of years before the birth is now unfolding in front of them. And interesting, the worship and gifts the Magi brought, brought by the Magi, actually was a precursor, a precursor of what to expect 
once the Lord Savior Jesus Christ's ministry came to full fruition on earth, the majority of the Jews and respected leaders would reject him. Would reject him. Remember, the Jews wanted the crown before the cross. They wanted the crown before the cross. So they did not recognize the Messiah when he was right in front of them. That was their big issue. It's a big issue of what? Arrogance. Arrogance. Arrogance left unchecked leads to more mental attitude sins like bitterness, insecurity, anger, jealousy. They just pile up. They're like wicked little cousins that are all connected. This will eventually, eventually come out in the form of hypocrisy and outbursts of anger toward those you feel threatened by. It's just a fact. It's eventually going to come out. Garbage in, garbage out. The problem is when the mental attitude sins take over, almost everybody and everything, almost everybody and everything makes you feel threatened. Once this kind of arrogance has taken a, a spot in your soul structure, many people today... Are a medi are, uh, they need medication for anxiety, depression, and they truly, I think personally, just need to get a relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let the Word of God wash over their soul, and eventually they can be free of that dependency. Now, that doesn't necessarily fit for everybody, but the majority, yes. The majority, the Word of God would do a, a world of good. I've mentioned it before from the pulpit at Grace Bible Church, where I'm an associate pastor, that um, I've done studies and I've come up with the fact that about 80% of all the meds taken worldwide across the whole globe are taken by American citizens. Staggering. Really staggering. Proverbs 28.1, the wicked flee when what? No one is pursuing, but the righteous are bold as lion. Living continually in the sins of haughtiness, right? Arrogant spirit, selfish ambitions leads to paranoia as well as implacability, never being satisfied, implacable. See, many people end up walking around like this. Many people end up walking around angry and paranoid. King Herod had several medical issues at this point in his life, but most certainly Herod was dealing with mental attitude sins that were crippling his soul. Crippling his soul. The haughtiness of King Herod was the downfall of his reign. That's what it was, as most kings. That's what happened if you do a study in the ancient times in the Bible. Most of them, uh, it's, it's some form of pride or arrogance that brings them down. All his past mistakes were decisions made from a point of pride and selfishness that had accumulated. Now he had a breakdown of mental, mentality really, and physical illness. Mentality coupled with physical illness. Actually, one brings on the other. Anybody knows anything about medicine, one will bring on the other. Mentally, if you're stressed out, depressed, and having mental issues, you are more prone to have physical issues. It's just a fact. Just like if you're going through a physical illness, if you can keep your spirit up, and they even say that if you're a spiritual person and connected to God and you have a relationship with God, you have a better chance of surviving and being healthier. Keep these things in mind. But Herod's a mess right now. Remember, God is not mocked, right? Whatever a man sows, this he will also what? Reap. You guys know these scriptures. We never truly get away with being evil. You never, never get away with being evil. Living a lifestyle opposite of the plan of God, it just doesn't work in the long run. It all comes around. And it all comes around to bite us right in the butt sooner or later. Don't be fooled. And a lot of people can be saying amen to that right now. If you've been around uh, the earth, uh, you know, 25 or 30 years, you kind of start to see how things have bitten you in the butt, decisions you've made. The Word of God teaches us that sin gives a pleasure for a season. Sin gives a pleasure for a season, but ultimately it brings forth some kind of death. King Herod was a puppet, a puppet for the Roman Empire and a false friend of those Jewish leaders and the hierarchy in Palestine. We can close out this section with some principles surrounding King Herod. I think it's probably a good idea we, we can. Looking at Herod, his relationship with the Roman leaders and the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Roman Empire was concerned with two things once it secured a city or a culture. Maintaining power and taxing every dollar. Every dollar they can squeeze out of the working class people. Those are the two areas of the Roman Empire. That's all they cared about. Once they, once they militarily wiped out an area and took it over and they secured it, one thing they want to do is maintain power. They keep a presence there and let you know that they're there to kick butt and take names if you get out of line. And then they would tax the heck out of them. They would tax the heck out of the people, squeeze every dollar out of the working class people that they could. They would allow the people... This is, a, you know, they, they would say, oh, yeah, you're free as long as you do what we say. You know, it's like, it's like uh, that military government that takes over, right? They would allow the people 
that they ruled over to have a little belief system if they wanted to keep it small and keep it under control, their little gods under control, as long as Caesar was a priority over all other gods, all other religions. Taxation was really just a form of robbing everyone to build up the Roman Empire and bring it to greater heights. It was like enforced socialism. It's one of the... Um, it's one of the descriptions you can look at of early socialism, really. Communism, socialism, all the isms we, we learn about in history. It was like enforced socialism, though. Everyone was kept in a lower class. It was a level playing field, but you couldn't, you couldn't get above, uh, barely above the poverty line. Lower class due to high taxes. Tax the heck out of you. So no one could ever rise above that lower middle class, barely on the poverty line, because the Roman Empire took portions of every product you made or bought or sold, or they took penny, every penny that you earned, they taxed the heck out of it, gave you just enough back to maintain a lifestyle just a, a step above poverty. Now, there were those, like I said, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, certain ones that were in the upper echelon. They liked their cushy position because they were allowed to be a little bit more wealthy. They were treated a little bit better, obviously. They had connections within the Roman Empire. Roman Empire dictated taxation, laws, regulations, curfews, you name it, as well as demanding respect for Roman hierarchy. You had to show respect whether you liked them or not. Believe me, a Roman soldier, Roman officer would walk by and the Jews would stand, you know, just stand there in fear, but as soon as he walked by, they'd spit on the ground. They hated it. The Roman hierarchy, you had to pay you know, your respects to that, pay your dues to that. They did so, believe me, the Roman military did so with full military might and a military uh, presence on every street corner, everywhere you went. They would punish with imprisonment at a drop of a hat, and they would use torture, yes, torture chambers, if you crossed any of their laws or standards. Public whippings, scourging, they called them. What do you think happened to the Lord before he carried the cross? Scourging his body, ripping it with, you know, with uh, seashells and glass and metal bits and rocks on the end of the whips. They were brutal. They would stop right before 40 lashes because that was the, the count where you would drop dead from the pain and, the, and your ripped flesh on the back of your legs and your back and everything crazy. The reality is, though, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they had their own little torture chambers, they had capital punishment, and they would dish out a lot of pain and punishment to people as well, believe me when I tell you. So um, it wasn't just all on Herod, really. You will find something here. When you peel back uh, the layers among hypocrites, if you get them together, you'll find many similarities and identical goals. Many similarities and identical goals, usually revolving around what? Self-promotion, greed, lust patterns, what I can get out of it, what I want. That's what it's all about for them. Hypocrites share a haughty spirit that is willing to use others, lie, manipulate, as long as the ends justify the means. You ever heard that saying, the ends justify the means? This is what hypocrites do. They're willing to tolerate those who oppose them or even those who are in a direct conflict with their core beliefs. They could be with somebody that doesn't even believe in the same God they do, believes op completely opposite but if they have a desired goal they want to get at and they have to work with that other person, they'll smile and pat them on the back and agree, oh yeah, your God is as good as my God, and blah, blah, blah. Big smile and patting each other on the back. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Enemies quickly become friends among hypocrite, the hypocritical crowd as long as they're all getting a desired result. As long as they're all getting a desired result. Meaning, they're all getting what they want in the end, Right? And if you haven't learned anything about hypocrites, I suggest you go back and take a look at some of these notes because that's exactly what you were dealing with when you were dealing with the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the great King Herod, Herod the Great. So you have an introduction to Matthew chapter 2. We'll get into you know the other verses, you know, 5, 6, 7, and everything. Uh, next time, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time that we had. We ask you to bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world, Father, through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.